Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Our next topic is all about digital innovations and their ecosystems and how they have significantly improved our ways of living and made them interconnected. Whether these solutions come from companies A, B, or C, the success relies heavily on numerous barometers that must be considered in innovating. This panel discusses how to determine a successful ecosystem which is composed of correlations of suppliers, customers, trading partners, applications, and third-party par data service providers, as well as the importance of touching points in other industry players. To dig deep on this issue, may I now introduce our keynote speaker, the Vice Chairman and COO of KPMG in the Philippines, Attorney Emmanuel Bonoan. Thank you very much and good afternoon to the to everyone, the organizers. Thank you for having me here. Let me first start off by um, sharing this, uh, what I hope to be a very brief but um, interesting presentation. Let me just get this in full screen. And please tell me if you, if what you see on the screen is the full, is the full screen. Visuals is okay, sir. Okay, thank you. So, you know, co-managing a firm such as KPMG, the KPMG in the Philippines, has to indulge by every curious mind, and my myself, my partners, and our people can work to be better today than we were yesterday. Uh, a few years ago, I discovered the magic, if you will, of intelligent automation to harness it to vastly improve our firm's processes and systems. This has made us more efficient as a firm and has enabled us to quickly respond to unforeseen challenges uh, that COVID-19 has uh, stolen our way. In this presentation, I, I intend to describe our firm's AI journey. Admittedly, it's only the beginning, but we've reaped so much and have already helped our clients begin their own journeys. One caveat, um, as the introduction to me stated, I'm a lawyer by profession and manager by experience. I am not an AI engineer, but I am the beneficiary of AI or artificial intelligence. And I guess that's what makes me the most the, the right person to be an AI advocate. I'm a user and a very passionate one that. This slide presents a broad sweep of technology over the past 150 years. And how did we get here? It took approximately 100 years for mechanical systems to fully develop. In the first and second industrial revolutions, Man did this by harnessing water and steam to power machines. No? Now, the third industrial revolution was defined by the computer and internet based knowledge. And within a span of 35 years from the introduction of the first mainframe computers, um, computers, semiconductors, and uh, the inf information systems evolved fully, and it still continues to evolve. The internet found widespread use within 15 years from the time it was first used, and it's still growing. In a short span of time within the history of mankind, we find ourselves at the cusp of the fourth industrial revolution, which is ushered in by cloud computing and the Internet of Things. Um, this is an era that will be defined by extreme automation and ubiquitous connectivity. Uh, it is now evolving at a pace so fast as to disrupt the long held place of humans at the center of the world as we know it. In short, artificial intelligence and cognitive systems will replace human labor and judgment in many areas of life. This is a scary thought, but one that we must contend with. Before I start talking about, um, before I start talking about uh, AI, I, I would want to talk about uh, some just just some terms and get them out of the way. Artificial intelligence. This is the ability of a machine to imitate human, to in, in, imitate intelligent human behavior, such as visual perception, speech recognition, uh, decision-making capabilities. No? The term AI is a general designation which covers complex decision-making by machines. Machine learning this is a type of AI that enables systems to learn and improve automatically from data and from continuous experience without being explicitly programmed. So ML focuses on uh, developing computer programs that can access data and use it to learn for themselves. Robotic process automation, this is the configuration of computer software or bots to execute mundane, repetitive manual tasks across applications and systems. 
This is a simple type of AI that finds so many applications in business transactions, and which I would like to talk to you about more uh, later. So, one of the most illustrative stories of how machines have developed the ability to think is how they play human games. Back in 1997, IBM Deep Blue, an AI-enabled computer, was the first computer to be the world chess champion, Gary Kasparov, three games two, with one draw piece. It was a breakthrough in that a machine actually beat a human being who was at the top of one of the most challenging cognitive games. But even now, some experts dispute whether Deep Blue was actually exhibiting artificial intelligence. You see, Deep Blue was actually using what's called a brute force search of over 200 million chess programs that had been programmed to into, it, into its prodigious memory. A quantum jump in machines' capability to play human games occurred in 2016 when the program AlphaGo beat Go nine dan champion Lee Sedol, one of the best Go players in the world. You may have watched this in the dramatic series of, of in the dramatic series uh, in Netflix's documentary called AlphaGo. And if one thinks of chess as complex, just compare it to Go. Chess has 20 possible opening moves, while Go has 361 possible opening moves. The number of legal choices per moves in chess is around 35, while Go has around 250. Because of the infinite number of possible responses the game of Go has, AlphaGo did not use a brute force search. Instead, it used what is called an artificial neural network, where by extensive training, it learned from actual play. A neural network is programmed to determine the best moves and potential strength of each move or combination of moves. So once the neural network does this, then it proceeds to improve its understanding of the, understanding of the game, resulting in better move selection as the game progresses. In other words, AlphaGo learned to play by being programmed to know the rules of the game. It then played, and by making mistakes which are flagged as mistakes, it learned to play the game. If you think that's amazing, then just consider where machine game playing is at now. Since 2016, Google, which acquired AlphaGo, has created new zero that can learn to play Go without even being taught the rules of the game. So the future of AI is exciting and scary. Just a year ago, I was reading articles that said, in the future, if you want to have a job, you must be involved in creating pursuits uh, because these were less prone to being taken over by machines. These were writing, design, computer program, etc. I, I want you to look at this slide and read along with me what I've quoted. And I'll quote, I'll quote a very short part of it. I won't quote the entire uh, um, paragraph. And I'll quote, I think creative expression is a natural byproduct of growing up in a diverse world. The more diverse the world is, the more you get exposed to different people, to different opportunities, to different places, and to diverse challenges. And the more diverse that is, the more likely you'll be able to put the dots for it to form, together to form something new. So if you want to be creative, you have to go for it. If you want to be a writer, you have to write. If you want to be a musician, you have to, be, uh, you have to create music, and so forth, and so on, and so forth. Now, that piece of prose was written by a machine when it was asked, how does one become creative? It's a machine that became, that's named GPT-3. And without being taught, it writes poetry, it summarizes emails, it answers trivia questions, translates languages, and even codes its own computer programs. By itself, GPT-3 possesses many skills that a company can utilize from answering more complex client queries to planning. And um, the list just goes on and on. So how have companies been responding to AI? In 2019 and 2020, before the global pandemic, KPMG concluded a global survey of how automation is perceived by business leaders. And some of the findings are that five years ago, automation was barely considered as part of any service delivery model. Today, it outpaces managed services, uh, centralized outsourcing, supply diversification, and regionalized delivery. 
and significant automation technology investments are on the table where more than 30% of enterprises are already investing with an average of $50 million spent on, uh, on intelligent automation. The majority of it, let me tell you, is in finance and accounting, which is an interesting point I really want to discuss later, being from an auditing firm. <clears throat> Based on HFS research together with KPMG, a third of respondents are piloting solutions across the spectrum of AI technologies. So a little over a quarter or 35% are moving into production, but only 17% on average have scaled. And industrial have scaled, industrialized intelligent automation technologies, and only 11% are already investing in AI and RPA. Next is that to have fragmented efforts to scale AI technologies result in little or no return, which means falling behind the competition the lesson of the story is that AI, AI tech has to be part of a holistic implementation strategy. In my experience, it's born out of a desire to improve enterprise efficiency. So understand the state of AI deployment and how broadly it is being used and in what ways is challenging for many leaders. This is amplified by the fact that the pace of AI uh, development is accelerating and can be hard to grasp. It's important to understand the adoption trends that both activate the learning curve faster for organizations lagging in AI development and the gap and the, which are gap fill and the gap filler for leaders. Now, so what are these trends? So first is that um, new organization capabilities. This every organization must have the right structure, leadership over, oversight, and talent in place. The organizational capability comprises four core elements: human capital values and norms of the organization, knowledge and expertise, and business processes and practice. Second is that the trend, second trend is that AI could shift the competitive landscape. A key question here is who will move up the AI activation learning curve the fastest? How long will it take and at what level of investment? Making AI as part of the overall strategic business planning and using it as a competitive differentiator by linking its implementation to other key investment technologies should be the top consideration for management teams. Next, there will be a rapid shift from experimental to applied technology. The AI landscape has rapidly, involved, has rapidly evolved in the last few years and is ready to deliver true value. AI is no longer a technology to watch, but is already a technology to deploy. And the rise of AI as a service. So, um, I always advise my clients, AI and RPA must be implemented as part of a process improvement program. The process must first, first be planned with AI and RPA as a solution. You just cannot implement AI and RPA and expect to make it work. In fact, even before recommending AI to clients, I always recommend that we first study and re-engineer if necessary, their processes first. Next enterprise, the next trend I think a very significant trend is enterprise demand is growing. Some of the high priority AI uh, initiatives are found in finance and accounting, customer and market insights, and back office and shared automation to remove um, repetitive tasks. So AI is not a future promise. It's happening now as we speak. You have experienced AI and you probably weren't aware of it. The seer in your iPhone that's in your pocket is powered by AI. The Alexa, to whom you give orders to, is powered by AI. Netflix suggestions of what you should watch and all the ads you see on FB feed, all powered by AI. But this is where I want to make a point. Every industry will be touched by AI. I'm joined by my, 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 my co-panelists are all from the energy industry and mostly from the energy industry. And that, ener that industry itself will be powered by AI. Just think of smart grids alone. The power for, a, for, a, for an energy distributor to be to determine at the smallest unit, the household unit, how much you need at what specific times of the day will significantly decrease, significantly decrease wastage of, uh, of very valuable energy. And hopefully we'll make it cheaper as well. So, what is the relationship? I want to talk about the relationship of RPA and artificial intelligence. 
and how these two technologies work together. So it starts with the simplest automation process called robotic process automation, which imitates a human behavior that, re that performs repetitive tasks. As the requirement evolves where the robot needs to meet tasks that are no longer repetitive, comes in the application of machine learning, which enables the ingestion of unstructured data and pattern recognition, which is at its learning stage. So advancing to this most uh, advancing to the most advanced stage, um, the the machine will now interpret data, vast amounts of data, and it could come from so many sources: text, video, uh, imaging, and make decisions based on a mix of evidence and probability, and based on a mix of probability and evidence, much like a human would. Again, think of AlphaGo. This slide might be a bit busy, busy, but it's very important to me. And let me just tell you the background story. A few years ago, when I took over uh, the finance and accounting of my firm, um, I walked into a finance accounting department, which had over 600 processes, over 25 people. And I thought over six, 600 processes and 25 people were too much. I needed people in other parts of the firm. I didn't need them in the finance and accounting. I didn't need 600 processes. So I sat down together with my business process engineering partner, and we determined we're going to cut the processes down to less than 300. How did we do it? A number of them were, were specific, were very simple uh, tweaks, but a lot of it was because of AI. Let me give you an example. Every Monday morning, I needed a cash balance report to know how much cash we had across our different bank accounts. And we'd have to put that from our enterprise uh, resource uh, tools. It used to take three people to do it, uh, spending over 14 hours. Imagine three people spending the weekend, charging overtime to do this, 14 hours. After we applied a robot to, to work on these tasks, the 14 hours became four minutes. That is such a huge savings on overtime, such a huge savings of people's time. And I was able now, and one, one, Unexpected result was that um, morale actually increased because people are now able to be put to tasks which allowed them to use their critical thinking. I was very happy with the results, so I mandated our tax division to use it. Our tax division, one of its jobs is to process um, tax returns for our clients. And we have maybe thousands of, of, those, uh, of those tax returns to fulfill. Each tax return if you look at the last row, each tax return would do around four hours to do. And after RPA, each tax return now was done in 30 seconds. Within the span of within two months from the time that we implemented RPA, we had saved six months worth of man hours. Imagine the time and save the times the time saving effort that went into all of that and not to um, and another benefit of that was that there were significantly redu reduced uh, instances of mistakes. So the next challenge was to bring it to our clients. And one energy company put uh, a very significant energy company here in the Philippines, put this challenge to us. How can you take 10 processes, maintain those 10 processes, but cut the work hours down from 38.5 38 hours. And we were able to cut all of those down to 5.4 hours by employing bots. And I'm very happy to say, again, this was done in the finance, uh, finance and accounting space, but I'm very happy to say that this has so many applications across entire enterprises. We're just applying it to the back room, but certainly um, there is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of applications for front room processes as well. So just some of the key, some key areas I'd want to highlight as we, I, some key uh, processes I'd like to highlight as we, um, as we go as in, in, in focusing on, on AI. First is to revisit to design the core processes and rethink the operating model focused on the advances of automation technologies. 
Next is to build a culture of automation by uniting IT and business teams. And next is to, to gain support from leadership to be able to apply AI technologies. Next is to, to start adapting, integrating um, under the AI umbrella, RPA, AI, and machine learning. And next is to govern the data to build the business case and machine learning models, commit to change management programs, and lastly, hire AI skills and digital skills properly, whether this be whether this be um, uh, internal or external. So, as mentioned in the last in the last uh, the last area to focus on, there are five notable areas that businesses can apply in gaining RPA and AI technologies, and four out of the five areas are external. AI will continue to play a significant role in the development of business, financial, and operating models in the 21st century. The decision and action that we make today will be one of the most significant deciding factors on who will be the winners and the losers during the time of intelligent machines. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you so much, so Dr. Nguyen. At this At point, point, I would like to introduce our moderator for this panel, Ms. Mirna Velasco of Manila Bulletin. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And again, welcome to the panel discussion on digital innovations and their ecosystems. I just like to show this one picture. Actually, Attorney Noel has laid down one thing that I should be fearing in the future. This is Eno. His real name is Innovation, and he was one of the robots who moderated a forum on digital innovations in China two years ago. What I am driving at here is that there would come a time in the future that even in panel discussions, it will be a robot that will be asking questions to the panelists, and I would be losing my job. So I'd rather take a shift or change in the future as well. So in our discussion this afternoon, this is my challenge to my panel. We should take it as a date to our audience and participants. It's a coffee date. And if you would have to talk about digital innovations, it's like a long discussion about big data, internet of things, advanced analytics, artificial intelligence, algorithms, and smart technologies. And you would say that all the boring stuff, and you know that it's a long day if you would have to drown yourself in coffee. But if we would have to shift discussion into other things, like there is an iPhone 12 that is coming to market. Suddenly, the mood could change. And there could also be an excitement that could be stared up. So what I'm trying to say here is that digital innovations can be made more exciting. It depends on how we would be presenting these things to our audience. Another example that I could cite is, if you have been to Singapore and you've been, seen the gardens by the bay at nighttime, you could see the beautiful lights in the gardens by the bay. And that is called biomimicry. It's about LED lighting and it's about employing technology and deploying technology in a remarkably different fashion because it brings out the creative side of humanity and also reminds us that there is beauty of life even in our digital innovations and deployment of technologies so my challenge to the panel this afternoon is to embrace life and beauty when we have our discussion on digital innovations and the ecosystems of businesses that you are in so that our audience would have a more lively uh, interaction with us while we discuss matters in the panel discussion so now I would like to call on my panelists. I have four distinguished gentlemen and a lady. I would have to call again on Attorney Noel Gunon, the CEO and Vice Chairman of KPMG Philippines, Ms. Joy Santa Marina, she is the Chief Transformation Officer of Energy Development Corporation of the Lopez Group of Companies, Mr. Vince Siamat, he is the Managing Director of 917 Ventures of Globe Telecom, Mr. Don Paulino, 
He is the Managing Director of Shell Philippines Exploitation BV and Mr. Raymond Dragolo. He is the Vice President and Chief Sustainability Officer of Manila Electric Company. There's a lot of things that we would have to unpack this afternoon. And to kick off our discussion, I would like to ask our panelists to give their insights and perspectives on the presentation that Attorney Noel had just given us earlier and how that would relate to the ecosystems of businesses that you have. Shall we go ladies first? So Ms. Joy, you have the floor. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, it's a privilege to be part of this Enertech panel on digital innovations and uh, its ecosystems. Um, thank you, Noel, for your uh, keynote speech. And thank it's you. really been a pleasure working also with KPMG in one of our digital innovation projects. So EDC is one of those who have um, I guess, embarked on uh, AI technologies and how to use digital frameworks in terms of uh, getting more out of our um, operations and our uh, business. So, for example, we've done RPA, and, and I don't know if Noel uh, used us as the example in his example earlier, but really our example for that was also on the finance end of things, wherein we, we wanted to become more efficient, our finance had no how to uh, get going about, uh, doing it, and, and we embarked on some POCs or proof of concepts that KPMG uh, uh, readily gave. And, and uh, before we knew it, we were saving, I think we're saving about a month's worth of overtime uh, by only deploying about 12 to 13 processes. And we have a long range or list of uh, other processes that we wanted to to digitize right but um in the whole framework of things i would say that this is just one component um there are several components that would make digital ecosystems really robust one of it maybe vince our friend from globe uh, 917 ventures can can maybe talk about would really be the digital infrastructure of the country. Uh, that means not just internet speeds, but also what are the things that are missing uh, in the infrastructures. Um, digital payments would actually also be one. We've seen how e-commerce and digital payments have, have really made the system uh, during this pandemic times a little bit more, I guess, doable. Uh, from the point of view of transactions. And then obviously uh, there's a change in behavior and I guess mindset as well as, as value exchange, right? From being very direct one is to one, it now becomes a shared pool if you're talking about uh, ecosystems wherein supplier, vendor, consumer, end users, and the corporations actually work together in order to bring the, the, the best of that ecosystem. And, and um, from an EDC perspective, what we've done is we've actually um, started the road towards um, full digitalization of, of our operations. I've mentioned RPA as one, but we've also deployed um, data analytics, sensors in some of our systems in order to capture data, prevent certain, um, I guess, operational efficiencies from happening, making decisions uh, on the fly. And, and that's really part of the whole, I guess, transformation towards a more digital uh, world. Next, I would like to call on Mr. Vince Yama. Vince, you have the floor. Hi, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, so for for at least our group in 917 Ventures, um, under 917 Ventures are several companies um, that we operate. Um, number one, first is Gcash. Um, Gcash being the largest um, fintech company here in the country with more than 26 million users. How do we use AI in Gcash? Um, we have a product or a service called Gcredit. Um, it basically uh, allows anyone to to take a loan um, based on a credit scoring. Um, so we do that based on your spending habits in Gcash. Um, in our core business, which is Group Telecom, we also do um, your typical next best offers based on your telco, on how you use your telco product. Um, so if you're a high spender in data, basically target you with um, relevant offers based on your usage. 
on ad serving um, in 917 Ventures, we have a subsidiary called AdSpark, which is basically a digital agency. And we're creating a lot of capabilities on ad serving. Um, we're, a, we're currently building a data management platform for us to be able to target ads to relevant audience. Um, on health, 7 Ventures have two health tech companies, Consulta MD and Health Now. Consulta MD is a telehealth um, company in partnership with um, Salud Interactiva. Of Mexico and Health Now, um, and partnership with AC Health. We use AI in triaging uh, health concerns. Um, usually in healthcare, there's certain protocols um, where you call in um, to, to assist them, and we use AI on, on that one. And also in 917 Ventures, um, we're basically a uh, data driven organization. We use a lot of data um, to serve our customers. And that data we also use to develop new products and services. So that's it for, for us. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Ms. Joy and Vince, for the insights that you've shared. Now I call them next to, um, I call them next to Raymond to share his insights. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Mirna, uh, for the introduction and, of course, Attorney Noel for a very informative and insightful presentation. Um, you know, again, uh, indeed, artificial intelligence uh, is everywhere and is here to stay. Um, and I see it whenever my son talks to Alexa on a daily basis. So I think it's definitely very real to me. Um, uh, well, again, as, as Attorney well, Noel mentioned, it's no longer a technology to watch out for, you know, but the technology to really uh, deploy uh, and to embrace. Uh, it has enabled Industry 4.0 uh, and has become commonplace in, in, in our daily lives. Um, and you're right, in business, AI is greatly affecting business processes and industries. But you know, if I may, I'd like to shift a little bit and not necessarily focus on AI, but really talk about digital innovation or dig digitalization and how it's really impacted uh, the energy space. No? Um, uh, it's become an imperative for businesses that want to maintain a high level of performance. And you know, the energy industry is no exception. Uh, in fact, it said that, uh, and I think Mirna knows this very well, there are three Ds, they say, that are shaping the power sector going decentralization and decarbonization. Uh, and I'll, I'll quickly shift towards decarbonization a little later. But if you notice, all of these three Ds are enabled by digital innovation. Uh, now, for us in Morocco, we are responding to these three Ds with a lot of earnestness and a lot of judiciousness. Um, and maybe just to share a little bit, on the digitalization, we in Morocco are driving uh, digital transformation on two uh, great fronts. Uh, first, the digital grid uh, and the digital customer. You know, under the, the, the digital grid, um, Attorney Noel mentioned this earlier, um, it's really about enhancing our distribution network as we build the grid of the future, smart grid. No? Uh, smart grid allows us to improve reliability, efficiency, and power quality of our network. And through it, we are able to address the biggest bane of our consumers, which are power outages and, and power quality issues. Um, now, apart from advanced network automation, a major part of our smart grid roadmap is also deploying smart meters to our customers. Uh, and this enables our customers to have a two-way communication with ourselves. Uh, and so for consumers, this means a far greater and more detailed feedback uh, uh, regarding their energy use and the, and the capability to adjust their habits to lower their energy consumption. For us in Meralco, this means eliminating manual meter readings, uh, being able to accurately demand, uh, determine supply and demand at any point in time, and you know, also achieving more balanced electric loads. Um, under digital consumer, we're leveraging technology to boost our customer centricity initiatives. Uh, for instance, we are enhancing our digital channels with the rollout of what we call virtual customer agents, um, especially in this time of, uh, of the pandemic, uh, and also an online customer appointment system. So you don't have to go to the BCs or the business centers uh, to line up uh, without an appointment. Uh, we're also leveraging SMS to push bills. Uh, and payment acknowledgements, uh, and also to enable bill equity. So there's a lot of these things that are going on in order to be more customer centric. Um, and a big part of that is also our Miralco online platform, which uh, um, has been you know, very much used uh, uh, during this time of COVID-19. The second D, decentralization. Um, uh, this means that what used to be a one-way street of delivering power to our consumers now becomes a multi-lane highway. You know? Power generation will no longer be centralized uh, because technologies like solar PV, uh, energy storage, electric vehicles, very near and dear to my heart, and microgrids allow for different forms of generation and power distribution. Um, 
And then finally, um, you know, I'd like to really touch on decarbonization. Um, and this is where we shift to just pure innovation or pure technology to innovation for good. Um, I guess reducing our greenhouse gas emissions is crucial uh, to cap the global temperature rise at 2 degrees Celsius as, as contained in the Paris Accord. Uh, now, this decarbonization effort in Meralco is a huge part of our sustainability agenda. Uh, and of course, digital innovation is, a, is core to that. Uh, to support that agenda, we bring to bear a number of sustainable innovations. Foremost of these are, first of all, our transition to clean energy, um, and second, our move to electric vehicles. Uh, under clean energy, we plan to invest in up to 1,000 megawatts of renewable energy projects in the next five to seven years. In fact, uh, our maiden utility scale renewable energy project, an 80 megawatt solar farm in San Miguel Bulacan, broke ground about this time last year, and, it's and that is expected to come online in the first quarter of 2021. Now, as I said earlier, also spurring our decarbonization efforts is vehicle electrification. A few months ago, um, we launched our own green mobility program here in Meralco, which is looking to electrify our own vehicle fleet. Uh, as we speak, we are deploying close to about close to 60 electric motorbikes for our business centers uh, to be used by our field reps during meter inspections. And really, this is just the beginning. We're looking to electrify other vehicles in our fleet motorcycles, cars, vans, even utility vehicles, such as pickups and basket trucks. Uh, and then, of course, beyond Meralco, we also provide green transport options for the riding public uh, through our company, Isakai, which very, very recently um, launched a breakthrough Makati Mandaluyong uh, electric Jeep operation, where we deploy uh, 15 zero emission public utility vehicles. Now, again, through all of these initiatives, as you see, we aim to leverage technology um, uh, for sustainability or what we call innovation for good. Uh, and although we in Meralco are, are in a way just beginning on this sustainability journey of ours, uh, we are committed to continue to do more to sustain energy for our customers and our communities, to sustain the future of our country, and, and of course, as we always say in Meralco, to power the good life for all. And a big part of that is, is digitalization and, and even AI. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Raymond, for those um, insights that you have shared. I have on Mr. Don Paulino, if he's around. If not yet, I have my questions for Attorney Noel. Attorney Noel, because you have a lot of energy companies. Hey, Mr. Sir Don, okay. You can take the floor. No, go, go, go on with your question first, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I actually, uh, you were not here earlier, but I asked about um, the impact that the that AI would have on companies like Shell, for example. But that is based on the presentation of Attorney Noel earlier. You might want to share what you have been doing as a company when it comes to digital innovations. Yeah. No, thank, thank you for very much for that question, um, Mirna. And, and, and apologies for, for um, coming in late. Um, we, we just had some uh, a couple of issues that, that uh, we have to deal with. Um, but 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 now I'm here. So so maybe if I step back and think about the digitalization of Shell, I think it's a broad spectrum, and I I, I can start from the basic where where we actually try to digitalize a number of things so so we can collect the data uh, properly, whether it's an operational data or even some some of your emails and be able to collate that properly. To the, to the wider spectrum or to the more advanced spectrum of uh, artificial um, intelligence. And I think for, 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 for me, uh, that the key, key enabler for a digitalization is really not just the technology, but actually the foundation. And, and the foundation on, on, on digitalization is really data that will be useful for, for, for everybody. Because um, it doesn't really matter where you, um, whether you have the technology to, um, to, to actually do a lot of things. But if you cannot get the data right, then, then it will be difficult to, to do actually the digitalization. And so, so that's what we've been really looking at until how do we actually get that data right. Now, if, if you operate a platform like Malampaya, there's so thousands of data points. And we've been very choosy on which data point to, to, to actually process. And, and I'll give you a very specific example on how we digitalize the data points in, in, uh, in, in Malabaya. So I'll start with uh, just one equipment, which is the compressor. So what the compressor does is actually transport the gas that we have from um, the platform, 
going back, going down to uh, Manila, to Batangas, and eventually to the power plant. So Meralco can actually supply uh, the, the electricity um, to, to, to the Philippine people. Now, for, for us to be able to do that, we need to make sure that uh, we continue to operate reliably and efficiently, meaning maintain a high reliable operation. Now, to be able to do that, we actually collect a lot of data about that particular compressor. And, and including the pressure profile, including the, the way it rotates, the vibration. And what happens after that is that we've actually processed it to a, a smart system where the system actually predicts uh, what potential failure we will have. And so even before a failure occurs, there will be a prediction using artificial intelligence and machine learning to tell you that potentially this is an issue that will crop up at you. And therefore, what we do is we it enables us to actually intervene much earlier and be able to actually do something on that particular compressor. Now, for us to be able to do that, we need to make sure that the design of the equipment that we have is uh, appropriate. Or if, if, if it was an older design, if, if it's something that we can retrofit. And at the same time, the algorithms that we actually put in on AI fits what we need. And, and for, for me, what I've learned on digitalizing in, in the energy industry, it's not a straightforward. It's not as if we have a solution, which is AI. This is what will happen. I think as uh, engineers and as leaders, what we need to allow is this iterative process of learning and continuously learning until you actually fit it in. And, and so what's the bottom line? The bottom line for me is with the use, proper use of my data, application to digitalization and the AI uh, facility. It allows me to maintain the reliability of facilities like Malampaya to 99% level, therefore allowing the Filipino to enjoy the electricity that they're actually enjoying now. Maybe I'll pause there, uh, Mirna, and, and, and tell me if, uh, if that didn't answer or answer your question. Yeah. It did answer the question. So my next question is for Attorney Noel. Attorney Noel, yeah, you mentioned in the, actually even before the pandemic, Industry 4.0 was already a flourishing trend for many businesses, and it has just accelerated because of the health crisis. Have you seen companies prioritizing more about digital innovations, and how has it changed actually when it comes to managing risk profile and for consulting firms like your company? How have you been assessing which ones are the winners? Well, I think the, your last question is really interesting. Which one are the winners? Um, there are companies that, uh, well, I'll, tell, I'll give you a story though. We, uh, at the start of the pandemic, we, it was very easy for us to, it was very easy for us to pivot and send everyone home. We have around a thousand people, uh, around 1,500 people working for us. And, you know, we had already earlier in 2019 started making investments in ubiquitous platforms such as these teams. No? Um, it wasn't known then, but it became known practically overnight. No? Two months into, into the pandemic, I was talking with, a, with the president of a very large bank, and I was, telling him, I was asking him what platform they're using. And he told me, Noel, we're still on Viber to communicate among ourselves. And you can immediately tell it's a funny story, I know, no? And really yeah. odd. You think at this point, it's, but that was the way it was at the, at the start of the pandemic, no? So you could already tell what entities were all, were going to be winners and what entities are losers, but primarily because how are the leaders of that entity looking toward innovation? No? If they didn't see innovation as important, the leaders themselves, then you can already tell this, this company, forget it, it's going to be left behind. So that's why I'm actually very honored to be here among some very innovative companies, um, some of whom uh, I, we, many of whom I work with now. And I can tell you that their leaders really have a very forward view of, uh, of where, of, of their attitude and uh, toward technology and how technology should be applied. Some of the, some of the stories being, um, being uh, related by uh, Raymond are, are just so resonant because obviously what Miracle does affects everything that we do on a daily basis. EDC, it's it's a fantastic that they're very that they were quick when I was talking to the CEO about robotic process automation. 
he hadn't heard about it, but he was very curious about it. And, you know, we educated him and his team very quickly. And they are one of the first adopters of RPA among the large companies here, you know. Uh, Shell, who can, who can say anything about Shell? I mean, you know, and, and Globe, they're one of the leaders in tech. So, so you can tell that um, it, it takes leadership to be a winner in, when it comes to technological, technological uh, innovation. Yeah, just very quickly, a follow-up question. Have you seen some new business partnerships emerging because of the traditional setup that we have, especially in the energy and then the emerging, emerging trends because of digitalization and digital innovation? Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, not, you know, not everyone now has the has um, a monopoly on, on technology, you know. Um, like for us, I'll give you an example. We're not, we don't have each and every technological advancement in the firm. So alliances, which you mentioned, are very important. We've, we have global, KPMG has global alliances with um, firms like Microsoft, uh, Amazon Cloud Services, Google, you name it, no? And we we bring all of these, and these alliances are also reflected in the Philippines. And um, we bring the best of all these, you know, as uh, we bring the best of all these technologies to our clients. So I don't think any one firm now has a monopoly on on knowledge when it comes to technology. As I said, it's even when you talk about the spectrum of AI, there's so many so many levels: RPA, machine learning, art, you know. So. To integrate all this, you need more than one firm, more than one company. My next question is for Vin. What are the new trends and new innovations that you have introduced to market? And if you can walk us through the incubation program that you have done, uh, the velocity, and what are the next trends that will reign in the field or in your view? Okay, uh, thank you for that question, uh, Mirna. So 917 Ventures is a is Globe Telecom's corporate incubator. Um, the agenda is to unlock the unfair advantage of Globe Telecom. So we build, operate, and scale businesses for the Philippines and for the region. Um, currently under 917 Ventures, as mentioned earlier, are different companies that we currently manage. Um, and most of these companies are solving customer pain points. Um, so, for example, Gcash uh, is our fintech um, company in partnership with Ant Financial, more than 36 million users. Um, during the pandemic, um, as most of you know, um, Gcash um, helped a lot of our clients um, here in the Philippines um, do their financial transaction. We also have AdSpark, our digital advertising agency. AdSpark is helping advertisers acquire customers efficiently um, digitally. Um, Consulta MD and Help Now. Um, Health Now, which is again, as mentioned earlier, a partnership with AC Health. It's a COVID startup. I want to call it a COVID startup. It's a startup that we built because of COVID, right? Um, it allows anyone um, in the country to have access to quality healthcare 24 7, anytime, anywhere. Um, another COVID startup that we put up is PureGo. PureGo is in partnership with PureGo, um, one of the largest retailers in the country. Um, this basically allows any Filipino to shop or to do the grocery shopping online. And then we have loyalty uh, loyalty platform called Rush and PB Manila, the conversion um, channel. Um, regarding Velocity, um, Velocity basically is our venture builder program. Um, it is a regional incubation program wherein we're looking for venture builders to build the next big thing here in the country. Um, so we're looking for individuals to pitch their idea um, to us. And if they get accepted into the program, we will build the startup together. Um, we will provide the resources needed to build that company and give strategic directions. We fund it, we scale it, and just like how we scale their current businesses. Um, so that's basically it. And the, the other question that you you mentioned, Mirna, what's what's in the future? What are the new trends? Yeah. Uh, what are the next? The next, there are a lot, right? Um, so I guess the, the most important thing is look at the customer, right? What are these pain points that they're, try, that they're trying to solve? Um, and how can we help them? Um, our focus area, like what I mentioned earlier, health tech, um, fintech, um, data, advertising are big pain points. Uh, and strongly believe that we're, um, we need to solve a lot of 
a lot, a lot of that one. Um, so for example, for fintech, fintech is growing, right? Um, we're in a fintech um, um, conference. Um, I strongly believe that there's still that big friction when it comes to, to fintech. Um, blockchain or decentralized finance, I believe, um, will happen in the next, well, it's happening now, but I think it's going to be accepted in the next few years. Um, so, and therefore the friction points um, when it comes to sending money or remittances will be a lot lower. Thank you. And I just want to build alliance with you, with these energy companies. What will keep you awake at night to help in their digital funds? Uh, is that very clear to me, Mary? Hello, yeah. Mira. I'm back. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Ah, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> My next question is for Miss Joy. What we have right now are the power plants that are having a lot of troubles when it comes to force outages. And what they have now in other countries are, are actually digital power plants. I've seen one in China. It's like a power plant in a space, and the power plant owner or operator could actually bring that home. Eat with that interface in a computer, and he can bring that in a car, sleep with that interface in a computer of his power plant. How have we been innovating so far when it comes to addressing the force outages or the dilemmas of power plants in the country so that we would be able to spare the consumers from more brownouts? Yeah, thanks, Mirna. I think what you're talking about is what we call digital twin. Um, yeah. In which case you see the whole power plant from a you know a digital oh. basis and you can really control it right. Um, in the case of EDC, we're working towards that, but not only from a digital power plant perspective. But if you recall, we are a renewable energy company, so we actually have the upstream side of things and not just the power plant, uh, which is quite different from the other. Um, I guess, power uh, players in the industry, right? So what we've done uh, so far is actually to look at the value chain of the whole um, ecosystem of, of our, our generation and actually put in the necessary platforms in order to, I guess, have the data, analyze, be able to analyze the data, be able to predict certain outages and, uh, I guess, um, react or, or address it even before the outage comes, right? It's a whole asset management thing and an operational uh, thing that actually um, goes in the realm of how do we then make ourselves more resilient, more efficient, and I guess in, in the case of your question, how do we become more reliable? Yes. So that's really how we're looking into it. Yeah, thank you very much for that. My other question is for Raymond. Because you are the face of EV when it comes to Ralco, and you're also one of the face of EV. But there would be a lot of landscape change once electric vehicles could make its uh, commercial scale roll out in the Philippines. But how would you address concerns like day, uh, time of day charging? Because there's a lot of peaks within the day. There could be 10 a.m. and 2 to 3 p.m. peaks that we would have to handle. How will you be addressing that? And the other question was in the, is on the infra because we are very slow on that uh, side of things. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the question, uh, Mirna. Um, uh, so the first question on how we address um, additional load on, on, on EVs, right? Um, so what we've done in Meralco for quite some time now, we've been very much plugged in, pun intended, uh, to the EV space. Um, primarily because we want to be ready when the additional load, as you say, from vehicle electrification reaches commercial scale. No? Uh, as early as a decade ago, we started working, so that this was around 2010. Um, we started working closely with the EV players in the country to understand what vehicles will be coming into the market, magnitude, timing, use. No? And, and this information allows us to plan ahead in terms of energy sourcing and, and, and electric facility upgrades. Uh, in parallel, we we uh, we analyze the charging requirements of EVs to better understand how they could affect the grid. Uh, and our Meralco Power Lab tests various EV and charger units to determine energy demand, charging characteristics, and and, and and a lot of these other KPIs. Finally, just another point. Uh, apart from just using the traditional grid, 
we in Morocco also continue to explore the feasibility of, re of using renewable energy to power EVs. Um, I always get that question no, in, in, in conferences. You know, you're, you're talking about a clean vehicle, but your source of power is not clean. No? Yes. So now we're trying to say, look, let's try to see whether we can make renewable energy and EVs work together. So as early as seven years ago, 2013, we already had a working demo on our campus here in Ortigas of a you know, relatively small, no, 5.7 kilowatt solar and wind installation showcasing the capability of renewable energy sources to charge EVs. Uh, once matured and at scale, these renewable energy sources, uh, as jo Joy could attest, I mean, will help manage additional demand, especially for harder to reach areas, as well as for areas rich in solar and wind exposure. So that's kind of what we're doing. However, you know, let me kind of bring in the reality of the situation. Uh, looking at the projections, um, if we go business as usual, Come 2030, it is estimated that EVs would represent an additional load of close to 60 megawatts on the grid. Uh, and this is roughly equivalent to 600 e-cars on the road at 110 kilowatts per car. Uh, and that is well within what our network can supply even today. Uh, as you know, Mirna, our peak demand today is in the order of about 7,700 megawatts. Now. So EVs in 2030 at 600 meg 60 megawatts you know, rep represent less than 1% of that figure. Um, so I guess... Um, you know, if you look at the experience of other countries, there are two things that drive EV adoption, economics and regulatory support. Uh, economics, uh, the prediction is by 2025, we will be at parity in terms of uh, electric vehicles and, and internal combustion engine counterparts no? on an upfront cost basis. But on a total cost of ownership standpoint, even today, we are seeing pockets where you can actually deploy EVs, you know, particularly the smaller EVs, tricycles, uh, motorcycles and whatnot. Another thing that is driving EV adoption in the Philippines is the DOTR's PUV modernization program. And that is why we have you know, leveraged that to deploy our, our own e-jeeps e in Makati and Mandaluyong. But again, all told, a number, and if you look at what, what's happening outside, a number of countries have made very, very strong pronouncements to support the Paris Accord. I'll give you a few examples. Norway has mandated that all passenger cars and vans by 2025, only five years from now, should be zero emission vehicles. Today, half of the cars that you see in Norway is either an electric or a hybrid vehicle. Closer to home, China, world's largest mar car market, it's working on a plan to ban the production and sale of fossil fuel-based uh, vehicles. So these are the, the statements that, are, that I think are really driving change in those jurisdictions. And until we can make a really, you know, a similar statement here in the Philippines, I think it will be quite challenging for EVs to make a dent on oil dominance in the, in the Philippine transport sector. So that's that's kind of my take. I think the point is we're preparing, um, but if you look at the numbers, it's not going to be a huge, huge dent unless unless we do something very special about it. And I think there is some work that's that's to be done. I, 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 you've probably heard about the EV bill that is being discussed in Congress and in the Senate. If that passes, I think then we're seeing a, a you know a huge uptick, and and we're quite excited about that. Yeah. Thank you very much, Raymond. Next question is for. Mr. Don Paulino, Sir Don, the biggest challenge that we have right now is finding the next Malampaya. How would digital innovation be able to help ENP companies for us to find the next oil and gas major scale reserve for the country? Yeah, no, that that's a very good question, um, Mirna, and quite difficult to, to answer. To. But but it, because for, for for me, if you step back on um, exploration. What, what do you really need in to, to, to be able to understand the, the geological conditions in a particular area? One, one you need the seismic data, uh, which is really bombarding subsea, uh, below the sea level, in the land with, um, with ultrasonic waves. And depending on the amplitude that it comes back, you actually analyze the profile of what's um, really underneath, uh, underneath that. And then the other part of that is actually the actual drilling so to confirm where, where the reservoir is. Now, if, if those are the two things that you need to understand the, 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 the profile of your, of, of your um, reservoir, then digitalization plays a big part uh, in, in a lot of that. So, so if you look at it from a seismic perspective, that is collecting millions of, of, of those ultrasonic waves. And, and for, for us, what the technological advancement have done now in the past is we will analyze that on a, uh, a per point basis. So it's very manual when we initially analyze that. Now what happens is that we even have a high resolution version 
of all those waves. And what it does to us is that it allows us to clearly see what's really underneath the ground in, 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 in terms of profile. So, so that's, that's one advancement that, that has happened in, in that. And then the other part is if you apply machine learning or AI on that, it allows you to, to actually um, use the data you had in the past compared to the data that you're getting right now to really understand uh, the, the probability of your success. As you know, exploring is not a high probability business. We were talking about 8%, uh, if you're lucky, 20% probability of success when, when you actually explore. And that, that doesn't even the commercial success uh, around that. So what uh, digitalization has helped us on is using those data. It actually allows us to predict where to do the seismic, uh, how to process the seismic. Now, the analysis still relies on the geologist. But what happens now is that from normally it will take us about a year, it actually cuts the analysis to, to a much shorter period. Uh, sometimes it takes six months for, for something that we will do in, in, in one year. So easily you cut it off. Therefore, you can intervene much quicker, you can plan much quicker, and hopefully develop the field much quicker. Thank you for that. This is my question both for Attorney Noel and Vince before we would go to our closing statements. AI and digital innovations would be snatching job from humans. So how do we scale up skill of talents so that we would be able to adopt to digital innovation and the technology deployments that we would have to do in the future? Um, I really feel that we should look for or build a country wherein everyone's entrepreneurial. Um, like in 917 Ventures, what we do is solve, again, customer problem. Um, so in, in, in our business, we're basically looking for entrepreneurial individual, someone with grit and a team player. Um, this kind of people create solutions, right, for, for the nation. Um, if you are someone who is really passionate, right, and obsessed about solving a problem, um, I think that person can build great things um, because there's really a big possibility, right? If you're an individual and if you're really obsessed with the problem that you want to solve, 
um, I don't think that you'll give up easily right, in solving that problem. If you solve problems, you basically create new businesses. When you create new businesses, you create more jobs. I strongly believe that the companies that we're currently building now in this country are going to be the big companies in the next five years. I really encourage everyone um, to look into solving customer problems um, now. The capital is in the country. Um, capital is available. Um, it's just a matter of identifying that customer problem. AI will follow, right? Um, because AI is basically all about optimization of your cost. Um, but the most important part is really identifying that problem and falling in love with it and solving it. I just hope that we have more time when it comes to this panel discussion, but we are now going to our closing statements. So what would be the next big trends to watch out when it comes to digital innovations? I'll ask for your closing statements and we would have to answer that question. I'll go first with Sir Don. There's no sound. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So, yeah. so your your question is, what are the big trends uh, that it would, with respect to, to innovation? I've always believed in the fundamentals uh, in in um, in actually doing business. So, so I will not necessarily go straight to digitalization, but instead I'll go back to what Ben said. Really understand what the problem is. And for, for me, I'll, I'll just give you a, um, a very specific story around it in, in, in terms of what we deal with in the, in the oil and gas sector. Uh, and, and it might not be a digital uh, solution that we have, but it's still a high-tech solution that we eventually led up to. Now, so, so the challenge that we have in, um, in, in the upstream, in the oil and gas, is actually corrosion. So, kalawang. So, and, and that's a challenge that, that we continue to, to, to have. Um, uh, a platform, when you put it in the North Sea, uh, will only last uh, maybe five years before really corrosion starts eating it out. And, and that's the same uh, for, for some of our power plants. That's the same for, for some of our um, um, facilities here in, in the Philippines. So what, what we did, so together with the local paint manufacturer, um, in, instead of actually me continuing to buy imported paint, is actually do our own research and development with them. And we said, there are two things that we, we need to, to, to be able to do on this paint. The first one is I should be able to apply it quickly. The second one is I should be able to apply it even though the wet surface is actually, an, well, it, the surface is actually wet. And the third one that we ask them is when I apply it, the thickness of the paint should actually be at a certain level. And, and, and for, for me, Talking with that paint manufacturer initially, wow, that, that's a difficult ask that you're asking. But what Shell has done is actually, we actually provided the services of our engineers, the corrosion engineers that we have, the, some of the materials engineers that we actually have. And together, we were able to develop a product that actually makes it much easier to apply, get the right thickness, and apply when it's wet. Now, it's not digital. But for us, as an industry, that's highly technological. And now the company that we partner with is actually selling that paint to other companies uh, and to other industries. And we're benefiting, they're benefiting. So for me, um, maybe the biggest trend that I would say uh, coming out of that story is this really close collaboration between the problem owner, which is sometimes a big company, and the solution provider. I think in the Philippines, we really need to continue doing that because there's a lot of solutions that is available out there. We just need to, 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 to tap that. Thanks a lot, Mirna. Thank you very much. Raymond. Thanks, Mirna. Um, and again, thank you to everyone. Um, it's been a real pleasure to be here. Uh, um, I'll take your question a little bit differently. I know it's a technology question, but I, I, I will have a different take um, and, and but I will continue to answer on, on uh, continue to answer you on what you, what I think is the big thing that's coming next and I think that is uh, that is sustainability um, the movement for sustainability um, I think um, more and more we're realizing that business as usual is no longer an option our world is 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 very much unwell and of course technology is one of the solutions to make things better but I think 
that technology has to be applied towards sustainable innovation if we're if we're really going to have a chance at making making everything work. Um, and and so we're talking about things such as renewable energy. We're talking about things such as battery energy storage, electric vehicles, and microgrids. I think for me those are what are you know those are the technological innovations in the energy space that will really and truly matter in the coming years and sooner rather than you know sooner rather than later. I think. Vince? Yes. Um, so I agree you know, um, with Raymond on, on sustainable development. Um, Globe Telecom is a strong supporter of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we ingrained these goals in the businesses that we build um, in Globe and in 917 Ventures. In fact, we support 10 of the 17 goals of, the, of SDG um, and we align our initiatives um, um, through that one. For example, we do good health and well-being. Um, we do a lot of things um, basically to, to provide economic growth to the country. Can you hear next from Attorney Noel if he's still uh, on the frame? If he's not there anymore, I have to save the best for last. Miss Joy? Why am I the best? <laughs> anyway, um, you know, I think the biggest trend um, that's happening right now is that the world is reimagined. We, because of the pandemic, everything that we have uh, thought of as the world we live in is now different, right? And, and we have to respond to that difference and, and find a way or find a path forward. And I can imagine, I, I'm in the renewable energy sectors. So I'm very quite passionate about this. We consume 1.7 five times of the earth every year, which is more than what we can we can um, uh, harness, right? Uh, because of COVID, it is now just 1.6 for 2020, which is still a lot. Um, and and it, it's something that's totally not sustainable. So one of the things, this is an energy tech, um, I guess, panel, but we're very much into how do we make ourselves not just sustainable but renewable and i urge on the panel and everyone here uh, to reimagine that kind of future there are some leeways and and a lot of things that are needed for that to happen but the urgency for that is very clear right and and the digital frameworks by which we work on it to develop the necessary ecosystems to develop the technologies really solves or tries to solve that problem and, 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 and that problem is how do we make the world, you know, uh, beyond COVID, reimagined in the way that will make us avoid this type of pitfalls uh, in the future. In a way, energy tech can, can um, support this, and we have to be one in developing the ecosystems behind it in order to make sure um, that there is a path forward for the Philippines. Thank you. Attorney Noel still there? So if it's not there anymore, in our everyday lives, we actually adopt to innovations. So this is a food for thought, actually. Is it really mankind that is using innovation or is it innovation that is using mankind? Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us this afternoon and stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you.